Hello and welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. Hello, I'm Linda and I'm here with my friend Paul. Hey Paul. And we're back. And <laughs> how are you today Paul? All right. Not bad. It's Monday. It's Monday and uh, it's a cold Monday here in sunny Melbourne. Yeah. One of the things that I can say that I genuinely know nothing about, I know there's a big list of those ones, Paul, <laughs> but this one I, I do absolutely not know anything about, are food probes and their use in ovens and Yes, yeah, so I suppose the reason for this is because we had uh, a couple of queries about it over the weekend. Um, and you came to the table with no other topic, so I thought, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's every time we do a podcast, Paul. So, But anyway, so food probes, yeah, I know nothing about them. Yeah, so these days, and I'm saying these days, um, of course, it's very dependent on your oven model and all the rest of it. But more and more manufacturers are including a temperature probe or a food probe, whatever you want to call it, into the... Uh, into the package of the oven, I suppose. So it's with your baking trays and all the other bits that come in there. And food probes, I think, are probably the most useful part of that part of that package. Um, and specifically around like low temperature steam cooking, there I think invaluable. Um, so your oven, as an example, was pretty early doors. Both your ovens, in, in fact. Yes. Because um, um, if you think about the time that you bought them, that's one thing. But the time they were probably developed and manufactured is quite possibly two to three years earlier than when yeah, you actually got no, them. Absolutely. Um, so depending on your oven, a lot of the – well, a lot of manufacturers, it doesn't matter whether it's premium or, you know, the price points differ, but it's becoming a bit of a norm. Um to have those things included, and uh, I've experienced a lot of people who haven't embraced them and used them. So there's certainly, um, certainly, I think when we talk about trying to get um, perfection out of our cooking, that's one thing that does the job for us. So effectively, what they do is measure an internal core temperature on the run. So you put the meat pro, or the food, it's a food, but it, is yeah. it just meant for meat? Uh, well, yeah, more so than anything else. So, you know, chicken, fish, beef, lamb, pork, duck, whatever. Um, not so much vegetables, but I suppose you could. But people don't really judge how a vegetable's cooked by its internal temperature, whereas we do more so for, let's say, a piece of meat. Well, no one likes pink chicken or... No, correct. And do you know what a medium rare carrot is? Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, so it, it can be used for yeah. anything. There are, you know, but generally they're used for proteins. And the sort of rule of thumb is people use them for larger, bigger portions which is not necessarily true. You can use them for smaller portions. So if you're doing, let's say, two chicken breasts and you're trying to steam your two chicken breasts perfectly, all you need to do is identify which one's the bigger one. And that's the one where you use the probe because that's obviously going to take a little bit longer. How far do you put it in? Well, now, Paul, this is a cooking show. <laughs> this is a cooking show. Um, okay, so... There are different, I mean, a lot of manufacturers around the world will source, so very few manufacturers build something like this, so they're sourced from it externally. So there's only about, let's say, half a dozen different included food probes. So a lot of manufacturers don't create that side of the engineering side of things, so they actually source it elsewhere. So although you might have, let's say, an ASCO oven, if you actually have a close look, um, let's say a, a visual oven might have this exact same probe. Now, the functionality within the interface works differently, but the probe itself is the same. So 
There are only a few different types. Um, if you are on the, you know, hunt for a new oven, um, have a look, A, if the probe's included, but B, what the probe looks like. So depending on the manufacturer um, and which one they've decided to go with, the thickness of the probe is the actual, how heavy gauge the actual needle is itself is one consideration. Um, the heavier the gauge needle, so the thicker it is, the heavier it is, all the rest of it, you'll have to focus in on doing um, heavier, more sturdy proteins. So something like a piece of fish, maybe you won't be able to hold that probe in place. Whereas a thinner needle um, might be able to sit there while the fish cooks, it'll be able to hold it in there. Sometimes a heavier gauge will leave a big hole and you may, you know, there's varying different sorts. And the re I'm getting to your question of how far, um, there are some probes and I know, um, so the BSH group, so Bosch, Siemens, Neff, Gaganau, within there somewhere, they do what's called a stepped probe. So it has three different points on the probe which measure different temperatures um, through the length of your piece of beef, fish, chicken, pork, whatever. Um, but really the key one is, is where the tip is. So the point of the probe, um, that's where most, and I'm generalizing, that's where most of the temperature is read from. So as long as the point of the probe is in the middle of the protein that you're cooking, uh, as close to the middle as possible, and as long as it's gone through as much flesh as possible. So as an example, you want it in the thickest part of whatever it is you're cooking, as close to the middle as possible. Um, they don't always have to go all the way in. Okay, so you don't have to push them all the way in flush. Um, so if you're doing a chicken breast, chicken breast has got a fat end and, and then a tapered end. So you, you just need to get the probe in into the fat end and, and put it in, I don't know, what's that? Four centimetres, five centimetres? Um, three centimetres. Three centimetres. Um, just so the actual tip of the probe is in the fattest part and because the fattest part takes the longest to cook and that'll give you your most accurate reading. Don't worry about the rest of the probe being exposed to the oven too much because the, what's called a thermocouple, so where the temperature's read is in the tip. So if you're cooking, let's say, a piece of fish, and as the fish cooks, changes the structure of the protein, uh, the probe might pop out, let's say, jump out. Now, it's not going to happen with a piece of chicken or pork or lamb or beef, but with a piece of fish, it may well. Um, if the probe's exposed to the oven, it's not going to give you an accurate reading. So if the probe mm. tip is exposed to the oven. Um, so as long as it ha hasn't gone all the way through down to a thin end, because if you've got it in a thin end or a piece of meat or chicken or whatever, um, it will tell you it's cooked much faster, but maybe the thicker end isn't. So if you're doing a tapered eye fillet, let's say, where you've got clearly a thicker end and then it tapers down to a tail, always go in the thicker end. Um, your tail might still undercook fractionally, but that depends on what cooking what oven temperature you set, but they are without doubt the way to get a perfectly cooked chicken, beef, beef, duck, pork, lamb, turkey, whatever. Do you have a probe in your oven at home? Yeah. Okay. If you don't have a probe in your oven, yeah. can you, any of those ones just off the shelf be yeah. okay? Yeah. Just get something that's... Um, I mean, there are lots of different sorts now. So you can certainly get um, digital ones where you can run the probe sort of into your protein and then you've got a digital readout outside of your oven. It's generally on a very thin wire. Um, they're fine. Uh, of course, you can just get one of the old school sort of almost like an analog dial. Um, yes, that's fine. Barbecue places have varying different sorts. Um, as long as you, you can put it in your oven and keep it in your oven, you don't want to get a sugar thermometer, particularly, because um, they're generally glass and got mercury in them. And... No, we don't want that exploding in our beef. Well, I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but nonetheless, oh. like, 
Um, but yeah, it's all about where you position it. Um, and just remember that in the case of, I'm going to use beef as, as an example. Um, and we're going to, I actually spoke to Joel about this the other day. We're going to post a sort of core temperature list for most common stuff. So proteins, mm-hmm. uh, we'll post that up on the website as soon as I've written it. Um, so your core temperature is your level of doneness. So medium rare, medium well done, they're all different temperatures. So if you set your probes to that temperature, that's when it will stop. Now, the trick with that is, is also understanding what temperature in your oven you've set. So if you're roasting a large piece of beef, let's say a ribeye roast, okay, it's quite a large, hefty piece of beef and it's got bone and various other bits and you want to get that nice colour on the outside. So you give it a good roast at 200 and then you drop the temperature to 160 degrees. Now it's still quite hot and you've got your, you want it medium rare. And you put your probe in and you've set your probe to 52 degrees, which is about medium rare. What you need to allow for is to carry over cooking once it comes out because things continue to cook once they come out of the oven, especially if you've roasted them at a high temperature. So you need to drop your temperature back anywhere between two and five degrees. So if I'm doing a large eight point prime rib roast, you know, and that's gonna feed 12, 14 people, um, I'm gonna set my probe temperature to about 48 and know that once the internal core temp's 48, when I pull it out of the oven, that extra four degrees is gonna happen while I rest. Now, alternative to that, if I'm doing slow, low steam cooking and I set my steam oven temperature to the same as my core finish temperature, um, then I let go all the way through. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. It does. But yes, they are incredibly handy. Um, most manufacturers too, if they include a probe, the workings of the probe is silicon. Uh, so they're heat proof. So if you've got a pyrolytic oven, of course, you can use them. Don't use them on a pyrolytic cycle, but they're, they're pretty much heat proof to about 220, 230 degrees. So they're just like the silicon baking mats that we use. Mm -hmm. Um, If you've, some probes will have a connection point within the cavity, some just on the framework of the oven. Uh, The ones within the cavity, if it's got a cover or a a little nut that you cover over where the connection point is, make sure when you finish you cover it over. If it gets water in there, so let's say you cook something with your probe, you've taken the probe out, da da da. Two days later, you go and steam something. If it gets water in there, you might find that next time you put your probe in, it might give you an error code or something like that. Um, best way to do that is switch the oven off, put the probe in, and turn the oven back on with the probe in and let it reset itself. But keep that entry point or the connection point where you actually put the probe in, so that's the part that talks to the uh, to the interface, keep that covered and, and dry um, because it is an open connection. So keep that bit covered up and dry if possible. Now, some manufacturers do have a cover for it, some don't. The ones that don't, it doesn't really matter. It's probably more around the engineering of where it's put um, and various other bits. Some will have a cover. Just cover it when you finish cooking. Um, But yeah, generally when you put a, a, let's call it an integrated probe, something that comes with the oven, when you put it in, the interface will automatically recognize that you've put, the, put it in, and then you just set your temperature. So when you when you generally do regular cooking, you set three things. You set an oven temperature, uh, well, sorry, you set an oven function, an oven temperature, and a time. Okay, they're the three things that you set when you cook anything. In the case of using a probe, you set an oven function, an oven temperature, and a core temperature. So time doesn't play a part here. How long it takes will be when it reaches its core temperature. That's when it's finished. So you might start from fridge cold and you put the probe in a piece of beef and you stick it in the oven and it will tell you that it's four degrees and then you're waiting for the next half an hour, 40 minutes, who knows how long. 
until it's reached perfect temperature. Now, people find that hard to work their way back because they don't know exactly when to start. What it does do is it forces you to rest. Because generally, you, what you find is when you start working with the probe, you actually, um, it is a really good indicator of how often you overcook. Wow, okay. So, and if something's ready, if your prime rib roast yeah. is ready early, mm -hmm. okay, and maybe you're 45 minutes early, um, it's not a bad thing because it's going to make you rest because you you finish cooking. So it's going to, it forces you to rest. They do, the best thing about them for me is show people how often they overcook something. So a chicken breast, you know, whatever it is, um, they are the only accurate measurement. Wow. it's temperature based. Okay. So you, if you write a recipe for a chicken that's 1.6 kilos, there are always variables. We spoke about this the other mm. day. There are always variables within that recipe. Like the recipe that I write and the way you prep it and the temperature that it is in your house. And there's always those little variables. Now, generally, it's going to work, right? But if you've got a probe, it doesn't matter if it's the same recipe, okay, those little variables are taken out because the core temperature is what you're working on. Well, in the past, I've been a little bit critical of some of the manufacturers' reference books that come with their oven. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to see any of those reference books to see if they've got a probe, what they list as the core temperatures, the ideal temperatures for the probe to work at? Um, I think some do. Um, I can't quote them all. I think, I'm pretty sure some do. They certainly give you reasonably clear instructions on how to use it. Some will tell you not to use them with, let's say, chicken. Um, and that's another important point too. You don't want where the temperature is taken in the tip generally, and I'm generalising, um, you don't want that touching bone, okay, because you're going to get a, a false reading. Um, depending on the location of the bone and where it is, that bone might get hotter faster or it might be colder and your meat might overcook. Mm -hmm. So just make sure it's not touching bone um, is an important point. Most of them will give you reasonably clear indication of where to put it, um, but not specifics around where to put it in a piece of beef, where to put it in a piece of lamb. Because, it, again, there's a lot of variables. So chicken's a tricky one, um, but you can do it. I've had quite a good bit of success. And consider them like, do you remember getting the old Christmas turkey, right? And you had that little pop-up red thing. You know, yes, little, yeah. That's all, well, that's, that's all this is. Okay. Yeah, it's telling you when it's cooked. Now it's more accurate. And when you are shopping around for an oven, look at one that gives you a real-time readout of what the probe temperature is actually at. So you don't want to just stick the probe in, set it to 52 degrees in, in the case of your beef, um, and then let it run and not see how far through the cooking process you are. So if you've started at four and 20 minutes later you're at 25, you probably know that you've got another 15, 20 minutes before it reaches 52. You want to be able to see where you're at to gauge roughly your timing for everything else. Mm. So something that gives you real time on the interface, or they're on an app now too, a lot of them, I remember. There's some. There's no, I don't remember this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but some manufacturers got app functionality where oh. it'll tell you on your phone what temperature you're at or you can set notifications when it gets to a certain temperature. So I'm at 25 degrees, I'm halfway through. I oh, now need to go and do X, Y, and Z. So... Um, but anything that gives you real time, you know, updates, and you can see that the, the probe temperature rising as it cooks, uh, they're always for mine the best. That'll give you a, a best indication. But this is getting to, like, regardless of function, so combi, steam, hot air, humid, moisture plus cold, whatever, you would like we've had that discussion before, um, just treat the two temperatures differently. One is your oven temperature and the other is your core temperature. And the core temperature is the important one because that's where you finish cooking and that's where you get, like, if you learn the perfect core temperature for a chicken mm. breast, change the way you think about chicken breast. I don't like chicken breast. 
change the way you think about it if you can cook it to a perfect point. So in a roast chicken mm -hmm. in your oven yep. with bones, yep. where do you stick the probe? So in through the thigh, um, so I don't go drumstick, in through the thigh. Now what I actually do is, is insert the probe until I get to the bone and I can feel the bone and then I actually just pull the probe back fractionally because closest to the bone is where it's going to take longest to cook in the case of a chicken. Similar with a leg of lamb for doing a leg of lamb roast. Um, as close to the bone as possible is best practice for those two things. Um, but it does take a little bit of practice. So you might, especially with a chicken, like with a, in the case of a beef rib roast or eye fillet or scotch fillet or anything like that, it's much easier. Um, because you've got a lot more sort of cylindrical mass to work with and you can identify a middle point much easier than all the rest of it. But because chicken leg meat takes longer than breast meat, um, you need to go in through, the, in through the leg. But if you mess it up the first time, it's not a problem. You can always throw the chicken back in and give it an extra cook and go, okay, maybe my probe was a bit out. So as long as you've got it in the right spot, you're going to get what as close to perfect as possible without guesswork like this is the thing about it they, there is no guesswork involved if you know the core temperature you just need to pick what function am I using so I want to do steam chicken so you pick steam what temperature of the oven am I using the temperature of the oven dictates how long it's going to take to get to that core temperature and that specific core temperature for that protein so if I want my perfectly cooked chicken breast, because it's 62 degrees centigrade internally, that is succulent, moist, juicy, awesome, I can certainly steam it at 100 degrees, but the outer outside of that chicken breast will be different to the inside. If I drop the temp to 85, it'll be better. If I drop the temp to 75, it'll be better still. But if I drop the temp and make my core temperature being 62 and my oven temperature the same, it's almost like, almost like sous vide type cooking. So you're cooking at the exacting perfect temperature for that particular protein. Now it cooks much slower, but the end result is dynamite and you don't have to guess when it's actually finished. Okay, well, not having seen how a probe <laughs> works, I would love you to um, show us by maybe bringing in a standing rib roast, Paul, and making some little Yorkshire puds to have with it. Wow. And give me a lesson, just yeah. a one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, ovens have certainly changed since we yeah. bought our little Bosch but if all you've those got a, years yeah, ago. If you've got a food probe, um, pull it out and give it a go. And when you're cleaning them, just warm soapy water in your sink. Don't put them in the dishwasher. It's another tip. Mm. Uh, quite often you'll see a little uh, black sort of, it's not a washer, but a little black rubber seal on the connection part of it where it connects to the oven. Um, if that gets really high heat in a dishwasher over a long period of time, it can warp, melt, um, change shape, and it won't. And that kind of works as a seal. Um, so you want to keep that <clears throat> the way it is and don't tie them in a knot because generally they're on a, a length of, you know, silicon wrapped wire about 30 centimetres long, maybe a fraction less. Um, just keep them, lay them flat, store them in a drawer, like whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and look, if something does go wrong with it, if you're finding that your probe is really like out, and this has happened to me too, just to have a look at the, um, the actual wire that, itself. So consider it like, you know, you charge your phone in your car, mm -hmm. it gets frayed, it gets bent, it gets warped, it gets, and look, Added to which, this is under pretty high heat conditions and it's going from hot to cold and all sorts of stuff. So just keep an eye on it. If you're constantly getting bad temperature readings, inspect it, have a look at it. And sometimes you can get a bum on, like there's no doubt. So just get on to manufacturer and generally they have, generally, you'll be able to get, get your hands on a new one. But don't forget that, you know, if you've got a measles gun, then you might well if they don't have a spare, you might well get away with, let's say, another brand. They might have the same probe. Just do a bit of research. But have a look in your user guide as to how it works with your interface. And that's the only bit that you really need to understand that and what core temperature you need to end up with. But they're fabulous. Really good. Wow, who knew? I did. Well, I didn't. <laughs> but now uh, 
And this isn't angling for a new oven, but this is they certainly have changed since our little one with the two dials. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Paul. No and worries. Happy listening to everybody out there. Stay safe. Stay safe. And we'll talk to you next time. See, See ya. ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in a modern world. We'd love you to subscribe. And for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com. Mm-hmm.